We are a planet in great peril. We really are. We are our planet in peril. Um, here are a few of the things, just a few of the things that characterize our planet. We have an increased concentration of wealth all over the planet. Um, an example of that, three billionaires in the United States control as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the population of the United States. This is happening all over the world. We're not on the brink of environmental disaster. We're in a stage of environmental disaster. Um, there's no turning it around with the environment. We have managed to despoil our habitat. We have increased government and corporate corruption all over the world. We have uh, more tyrants, uh, more autocrats, um, dramatic increase in uh, government corruption even in our own country. The deification of technology. We love technology. We love easy. We love fast. We love our computers. We love our cell phones. All of it we love. We love video games. We love pornography. We're just, and we don't judge it, folks. We don't judge it. And lately, robotics, driverless cars, things of that nature. We're all excited about that. And the thing that we may not realize is that that robot that's so fascinating might have your job in a year or two. War and violence. Violence is now an everyday thing in this country and around the world. Um, over the past 20 years, we have had over 200 school shootings. We only hear about the ones that take out a lot of students. It's become an everyday issue. And we get together after the shootings and we, we, we mourn together and, and, and then we forget about it in a couple of weeks and we just keep moving on. War, on the other hand, is becoming very commonplace. Uh, generally speaking, at least globally, there are wars over who has the right God. Um, and I think the thing that we don't think about a lot of times is that war costs money. It costs a lot of money. It costs trillions of dollars in the United States. And what does war get us? What are the alternatives? Free tuition for everybody? Better health care? But it seems like our politicians and, and industrialists have a real penchant for the business of war. So here's the question. What's wrong with us? Why don't we do anything about this? Why don't we reach out? Do we not care? Do we have no sense of what the meaning of life is, what we're supposed to be doing here? Are we so tied up in our own material gains, or power gains, that we don't think about this? We don't think about that long journey that we're on as a species? You know, around the world, we're known for our pleasure seeking and our consumerism. That's how we're identified across the world. So here's the issue. You know, I hear from people around the world these wonderful values, these these humanistic and life-affirming values, these wonderful things from people. But it seems like we have a terribly hard time putting them into action, actually doing the things that we talk about. It's like we like to be known by what we say, not by what we do. It's a big problem that we have so much difficulty accepting differences, our differences, especially religious, racial, ethnic around the world. And we're not doing much about it. Again, we're not, not really reaching out. We're, you know, small efforts. So when I, was, when I was in my 20s, I realized something that, that has bothered me ever since. And this, so I figured I would share that with you. Maybe it'll bother you for a while, too. That as a species, as a people, we have the inability to negotiate our differences without violence. You know, we might sit down at the table for a while and negotiate and talk a little bit. After that, it's like, well, no, forget it. Let's just get the guns out. We do it again and again and again. And I know the Pentagon's business is war. We have to be doing that. But who has the power? Here's the question. Are we a species in decline? Not do we have declining math scores or, you know, we're, we're not shaping up like we used to. Biologically, in a Darwinian sense, are we a species in decline? Now, we have ruined our habitat. We know that, and that puts us in, in, in a bad situation. 
So it's too late to turn it around. But are we a species that somehow is not understood quite what we're supposed to do that after a time we will no longer exist on the planet? So you might say, Eric, oh God, you are so negative. You are so negative. There are good people all over the world doing wonderful things. I know there are. There are wonderful people doing wonderful things. I hope that in, as, as an activist, I've been a part of some of those things. But we haven't reached any critical mass. There's not enough of that. If there's a critical mass, it's in all the stuff I've been talking about. So Carly and I came up with a list of issues that put human beings in conflict with each other. Now, the list is way too long. I could speak for a half hour on it. But, so we came, up, we came up with four that might be important. It seems like human beings have a real penchant, I mean, forever, not just now, for getting over on each other. It seems like we like to take advantage of people, we like to control people, and we see it every day. And, and it's not just financial, it's not just sexual and, and ethnic, and that we have this desire. And all I can think of is, you know, as a psychologist, and I hope I'm not oversimplifying, that maybe this is this profound insecurity that we have. That Secure people don't need to control other people. They don't need to get over on other people. There's nothing in it. So kind of a simplistic view, but one possibility, right? So Adam Smith, I want to talk about Adam Smith. In 1776, Adam Smith wrote the book, The Wealth of Nations. Many of you have heard of it. It is the Bible of capitalism. It's the instruction manual for capitalism. And Adam Smith says in it, and this is a quote, that capitalism is driven by individual greed and selfishness. Individual greed and selfishness. Now, Smith was talking about the, the theoretical marketplace, the ideal marketplace, where, let's say, for example, individual greed and selfishness. Maybe back then, I could make a better shovel than you and charge the same price I make more money based on my individual greed and selfishness. Or you could uh, offer a service I couldn't offer. You're going to make more money than me by that individual greed and selfishness. But what's happened over the years is that that term has, has lost its meaning, has been perverted in any number of ways, and now it just means that any possible way you can make money makes you a captain of industry. And I'm not saying all industries are bad, you know, not being dualistic, but it just seems like there aren't any rules anymore. If I can sell you air and make money on it, I'm considered a pretty profound success. And I think capitalism has become how, how little can I sell you and how much money can I make off it? We love those people. Do you think that your, your computers and cell phones and everything, that there's not an astronomical profit on that? mostly because those things are made by slaves. But, you know, that's, that's where we've gone with, with uh, Adam Smith. Uh, another character, Albert Bartlett, you haven't heard of him. He's a physicist. Um, he came up, uh, this was mid-90s, I guess, when I read an article that he wrote that started me on this species in decline kind of idea, okay? He came up with three premises. Listen to these. One is that we have <clears throat> unabated population growth. We have more people and more people and more people and it's not going away. Number two, we have the increased use of non-renewable resources. We're using them at an astronomical pace. They are going to run out. Some of them have already and they don't have replacements. Third, increased consumption per capita. Everybody has more stuff. More population more material use, more consumption. That is unsustainable, scientifically unsustainable. So maybe, maybe we simply don't understand the terms of survival. Maybe when that first ape jumped out of a tree and, and stood up and the human race was born, maybe that ape did, was not wired in such a way to understand how we were gonna survive long term, indefinitely. Um, maybe we lack empathy as, as a species. Maybe we're simply in denial. 
It's like, oh, everything's all right. Don't worry about it. Technology will solve the problem. It's no problem. Let's, you know, text somebody. Or it could be distraction. Everybody I know, folks, everybody I know is busy all the time. All the time. Uh, we must be very important in order to be busy all the time. What it says to me, the, the advantages of being distracted is that you don't have to think about yourself. You don't have to deal with your demons, which we all have to do if we're going to live a reasonable life. Um, we don't have to th think of most anything. We're, we're just, we're busy all the time. Victim status. Victim status. I can't do that. I'm, I can't be a social activist. I'm busy all the time. I can't care about these things. I'm busy all the time. Okay, it's inevitable that Darwin is going to come up in this. So, here it is. In 1859, he published Origin of Species. Um, a book that many people quote, but very few people have read. It's 600 pages of small type. The phrase that comes out of there that we all use is survival of the fittest. I heard it the other day on NPR in some context. Now, that could mean a number of things if applied to human beings. It could mean, hey, you know, I'm... I'm a pretty bright guy. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll have a little bit easier time in my life. Whereas at the, the other side of it, it could mean I have a lot of guns. Go ahead and get me angry and I'll blow you away. <clears throat> now, we've used this time and time and time again. I've heard it my whole life. Here's the irony of it, folks. The origin of species is not about human beings. He mentions human beings once, three pages from the end of the book. It's about birds and insects and butterflies. It's not about people. Fast forward, 1871, he writes what I consider his seminal work, The Descent of Man, in which he says human beings do have the possibility of change. They can change themselves. Because we can think, because we have emotions, and because we're capable of intentional change. So again, you can come back to me and say, Eric, you have no hope. You're, you're not a hopeful person. I'm not. I'm not. Here's, here's, the, here's the downside of hope as far, as far as I'm concerned. Let me think of a good example. Central Africa. There has been a famine in severe agricultural pro problems for about 10 years. People are dying. Not enough that we hear about it. When, when the little children start dying in droves two or three years from now, we'll hear about it. So you might say, wow, God, I hope something's done. I hope they get rain. I hope they get irrigation. I hope they get help. I hope somebody goes in there and, and helps those beautiful little kids because they're dying. I really, really hope something goes on. I hope. And you hope so much that you almost feel like you're doing something. Like maybe you're feeding the kids. Or maybe you're a social activist. That you're really doing something to help because you're hoping. And you're not. So, is there a solution? No, there is not. Thank you and good night. No, just kidding. That would be way too easy. <laughs> Thought about it, though. The next few decades are going to be pivotal for us. We might only have four or five more decades with the planet looking like it does, including our own community. Things will be dramatically different in this world in four or five decades. Maybe now's the time for us to, to be acting. So what do we do now? What do we do now? Maybe the first step to reaching out is reaching in. Maybe the first step to reaching out is reaching in. All change starts with individual change. How do we start? I think our problem is often that our behaviors do not reflect our values. Our behaviors do not reflect our values. 
Do your behaviors reflect your values? Thank you and good night.